Good morning, everyone. Welcome to the house of the Lord. Hallelujah. And we want to welcome those who are watching us online this morning. We welcome you to the house of the Lord. The Lord is good and all the time. Amen. Praise the Lord. Just a couple of announcements before pastor opens our service with the shofar. And some of you might be here visiting and we want to welcome you and you may not understand about the shofar, but uh, the shofar is blown for various reasons and quite often a call to worship, a call to prayer. And so Pastor Ron will be blowing that in just a few moments. And uh, especially in Israel, that's where you'll hear the shofar. Praise the Lord. Uh, reminder, today is the nursing home service, and Dawn will be conducting that at uh, Carlton Manor. If you would like to go along with her, it starts at 2 o'clock, so just talk with her after the service. And today is the final day for your Send Me Offering. And uh, we Dawn shared that uh, a couple weeks ago regarding um, an Iranian outreach uh, that's going to be happening. And so if you would like to donate uh, towards that event and the expenses of that event, just mark that on your offering envelope. Send me. Okay? Offering. And uh, the children will be dismissed after the worship today. I'll be teaching them downstairs. And Pastor Ron and I are going on vacation. We leave after lunch today. And uh, yay! <laughs> Thank you so much for that wonderful send-off. Yes, glad you're going. <laughs> I am. <laughs> I, can, uh, I can see it now. You're, you're, you're going to be well taken care of, yes. and you're happy yes. with that. Yes. Glory yes. to God. Thank you so much for everyone who just falls in line and takes care of things, we, even when we're not here, and so we can be at peace about that. Uh, we do have a little problem, though, as we drive away. We have a hard time not talking about church. And so we have to constantly remind each other, we're on vacation, we're on vacation, we're on vacation. But we love you, and we'll be praying for you. And uh, if you have any issues or uh, concerns or need a pastoral visit, please contact Dawn in the office, and she will refer either to a board member or others that, that can help in that area. And um, so please just go through her. We will be trying not to answer our phones, OK? <laughs> And next Sunday is Mission Sunday and Mother's Day. And Linda Foster is going to be sharing next Sunday. So, yes, yes. Looking forward, looking forward to that. So we'll be watching that online probably. Praise the Lord. And uh, so many other things going on. Just check your calendar. And uh, that's it. Lord bless you. I just want to be where you are, dwelling daily in your presence. I don't want to worship from afar. Draw me near to where you are. I just want to be Just one. 
Did you feel the mountains tremble? Did you hear the oceans roar? When the people rose to sing of Jesus Christ the risen one. Did you feel the people? Did you feel the people tremble? Did you hear the singers roar? When the lost began to sing, Jesus Christ the saving one. We can see that God you through the nations when young and old return to Jesus fling wide fling wide you heavenly gaze prepare the way of the risen Lord open the door darkness did you feel the darkness tremble all the saints join in one song and all the streams flow as one river to wash away our brokenness and we can see and we can see that God you a time of jubilee is coming when young and old will turn to Jesus. Play why you heavenly gaze, prepare the way of the
hallelujah to the to the Son of God. Let me go over with you it again exactly what goes on in the Lord's Supper and why it is so centrally important. I hope at this point you have picked up your emblems from the back and those that are watching online, I hope that you can 
get a hold of some bread and some juice, and that you can celebrate with us. I received my instructions from the Master himself and passed them on to you. The Master, Jesus, on the night of his betrayal, took bread, having given thanks. Father, I thank you for this opportunity that we have to celebrate your death, and we thank you for it in Jesus' name. And just like you did, you gave thanks and you broke it. Can I suggest we take our matzah and we just break it like he did? Right over there. Thank you, Jesus. He said this is my body broken for you. This do in remembrance of me. Those of you that celebrated Passover with us, you'll know at the, what, what, uh, what period that this celebration took part in. It is part of Passover. Let's partake together, remembering the Lord's body. He did say, do this in remembrance of me. And then it said, after supper, he did the same thing with the cup. Father, we thank you for the blood of Jesus that cleanses us from all sin. Even while we were in our sin, you died for us. We thank you, Lord. Without the shedding of blood, there is no remission, no forgiveness of sin. So he said, he did the same thing with the cup. This cup is my blood, my new covenant with you. Each time you drink this cup, remember me. What I what you what must suddenly you must suddenly realize that every time you eat this bread and every time you drink this cup, you reenact in your words and actions the death of the master. You will be drawn back to this meal again and again until the master returns. You must never let familiarity breed contempt against it. Each time you drink this cup, remember me, Jesus said. Let's drink the cup in remembrance of Jesus. How wonderful. How marvelous. How wonderful. How marvelous. How wonderful. How marvelous, how wonderful, how marvelous. How wonderful, how glorious, my Savior's scars, victory. My chains are gone, my debt is paid, from death to life, and grace to grace. When I see the cross, I see freedom, when I see the grave, I see Jesus, and from death to life, I'll sing your praise, and the wonder of your grace, when I see that cross, I see freedom, when I see that grave, I see Jesus, and from death to life, I will sing your praise, 
in the wonder of when I see, when I see the cross, I see freedom. When I see the grave, I see Jesus. And from death to life, I will sing your praise. In the war, when I see the cross, when I In the water of your grace, how my soul will sing your praise. In the water of your grace, how my soul will sing your praise. So wonderful, how wonderful, how glorious my Savior.
Because you find me all my fears and failures fill my life again give my life to follow everything i believe in now i And there's a mountain or, an, or a blockage in your life and you want to have that thing removed he is the mountain moving Savior he is the same yesterday today and forever we've got folks that have tags they're going to step out in the aisles and and if you uh, have uh, those things that, that you want prayer for you step out praise the Lord and you and and uh, and be prayed for and the, the same God the same spirit that raised Christ from the dead dwells in you that's why we have these folks today to represent those of faith that can pray and in Jesus name those mountains be moved those mountains be moved those mountains be be moved in Jesus name step out into the aisles and receive prayer in Jesus name it's an action of faith some of you if you can't get up you just raise up your hand that's an action of faith you can raise up your hands and people will come to you and they will pray over you in Jesus name Savior you can move a mountain my God is mighty to save. He is mighty to save forever. Author of salvation, he goes and conquers the grave. Jesus conquers shining light. Shining light and let the whole world see. We're singing for the glory of the risen King. Jesus, shine your light and let the whole world see. We're singing for the glory of the risen King. Savior, Savior, He can move the mountains. My God. magnify your name we magnify your name Lord we praise you Lord we praise you Lord shine your light let the whole world see for your glory 
of the risen King, Jesus. Shine your light, let the whole world see. We're singing for the glory of the risen King. Shine your light, let the whole world see. Of the risen King, Jesus, shine your light. Let the whole world see. We're singing for the glory of the risen King. Savior, He can move a mountain. My God is mighty to save, and He is mighty to save forever. Author of salvation, He rose and conquered the grave. Yes, He conquered the grave. He's our Savior. of the Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Praise you, Lord. Thank you for leading us in worship. We uh, bless the children as they go downstairs. My wife is going to uh, be their teacher today. And, uh, well, we just bless them. May you open their hearts to receive all that you have for them in Jesus' name. Can everybody say amen to that? Amen. I'm not sure why I'm supposed to start with this scripture. Psalm 34, 18 says, The Lord is close to the brokenhearted and saves those who are crushed in spirit. Wow. The Lord is close to the brokenhearted. Can you say that with me? The Lord is close to the brokenhearted and saves those who are crushed in spirit. Praise the Lord. He is a mighty God. And He is always listening to those that are, have a heart that has been broken and crushed in spirit. You know, last night I had an unusual night because, well, well, I dream, I'm a dreamer. And I had another dream last night. But the interesting thing about this dream, it was a reoccurring dream all night, pretty well all night long. Just kept reoccurring. The, um, the people groups that we're, we were ministering to, and, and it seemed like I was in the marketplace. I could see there was various markets. It was the same scenario in every marketplace that we went to. I don't know all the ins and outs of the dream. I haven't had time to, to really dwell on it. But this much I know, that the Lord is close to the brokenhearted and saves those that are crushed in spirit. And I do know that uh, we are to be in the marketplace. Jesus himself was in the marketplace. And I believe the church is the body of Christ. Thank you. I was just ready to turn around and have a conversation with Jesus. Because I believe the church is the body of Christ. And we are today his hands and his feet. The things that Jesus did so very long ago, by the way, he still does the same thing. He is the same yesterday, 
today and forever. And I believe that the Lord really wants his people, the body of Jesus, to go out and, and to reach. And you say, well, pastor, I don't have that ministry. Let me say this. The Bible says you do. Go into the highways and the byways and compel them to come in. I don't know what that looks like for you. Oftentimes, I enjoy just getting out every now and again. I'll go to a and to be with some of uh, my new friends there. And, of course, Charlie. And, you know, it's really interesting because, uh, well, they just let me sit there. And I, there's times I, I don't have to talk, but a lot of times I like to listen. But I will say a thing or two when, it, when I think like it's, it's funny or engaging. I don't always have to be serious. I can be funny, too. I, I just seem to have that way. But you know what? It makes people relaxed. And sometimes, just as music kind of softens the heart, you can talk. But so, so does having some fun and having some activity. We can sit down and play, and, um, you know, it's just a wonderful time. We're to be in the marketplace. And I can see that the body of Christ, you, you build relationships with people by being with people. It's really hard to build relationships with people if you're not around people. So we have to make ourselves available to that. Years ago, I, you know, when I was starting out in ministry, I thought I had to spend all my time in the office. And, uh, well, you know, there's always the jokes, well, the pastor really only works for a few hours on Sunday mornings. Oh, you haven't heard that one. Oh, good. I didn't tell you. But we find ourselves engaged in ministry, whether people are texting or they're calling and they have all kinds of needs. And I appreciate uh, this congregation that allows my wife and I to get away and, and vacate. Although, like Shannon says, it's hard because we're continuously thinking about the ministry. It's, it's just built in us. So um, anyway, I do think that it's important that we all have times when we were out. I remember I was conducting a Bible study years ago, and, and I would say to uh, folks now, how many have unchristian friends? And it was like I asked an, unquest, uh, an unchristian question. Because many at that time did not have non-Christian friends. I said, so you don't have people in your families that are not saved? You, you, know, you work in a workplace where there are Christians everywhere? How can we be salt? This is not even a part of my message. How can you be a Christian and not let your light shine. Shine your light and let the whole world see we just sang it. Shine your light and let the whole world see. You see, that light that God has put in you it is just not so that you can be bright. It's so that you can shine your light and actually be a light. Boy, I'll tell you, I learned a big lesson when I was in the prison system. We had, I was coaching basketball and we had invited the, the St. John Mill Rats at the time. That's the basketball team. They were, they're a professional players, professional team. We had them up to do a basketball camp. And you know, I walked in as I normally do down the halls and the doors are banging behind you and everything else and I walked into the gym and I met the um, 
the players that were there to give us this uh, uh, camp, basketball camp. And um, the fellow, one of the, their leaders said to me, they said, you know, he said, the moment I stepped in this facility, I felt God in the place. Now, how do you get the presence of God in a facility like a jail? Young people and some adults in some certain sections incarcerated for doing bad things. And he said, I, he said, I, I wonder how that could be. I just thought I could never experience the presence of God in an institution like this. And then he said, the moment I met you, there was a light. And then I understood. Because the presence of God is with you. When you step into a place, you have no idea of how you affect the atmosphere. Wow. Well, we are in part five. Father, I thank you for your word today. Enlighten our understanding and challenge our hearts, I pray, in the name of Jesus. Give us eyes to see and ears to hear and hearts that will respond to you in Jesus' name. We've, uh, we're now in, in uh, part five of living the new life. We've told you over the last few Sundays um, that the book of Ephesians, that Paul the Apostle wrote to Ephesus, the church there, it was like a boot camp manual. Teaching, this teaching is for when things are going bad and when things are going good. Just in case you're wondering, in this series, we have used and shown the scriptures from the New King James Version. And we're going to do the same thing, except that today you're going to see the NLT on the screen. I've used the uh, New King James only because there were some words in it that I wanted to use to help us in explaining some of the meanings of the scriptures so that we could plainly understand. In every translation or version, they bring out the same, the basically the same thought. When we were uh, doing our communion, I read from the Message Bible. I don't often use that, but I thought it would um, be different and sound different in your hearing, but you'll hear the same message. Hmm. In uh, every translation, it shows that the Lord Jesus Christ, by the way, the word Christ is not a second name like we would have. The word Christ actually means the anointed. He is Jesus Christ, the anointed. Praise the Lord. And the Lord Jesus Christ has already and already defeated the enemy hands down. Colossians chapter 2.15 says, Having disarmed principalities and powers, he made a public spectacle of them, triumphing over them. In the L NLT it reads, in this way, he disarmed the spiritual rulers and authorities. He shamed them publicly by his victory over them, where? On the cross. Praise the Lord. That's why we come together. That's the basis of our coming together. It is the basis of us partaking in communion. In 1 Corinthians chapter 15, it says, God has put all things under his authority. 
Of course, when it says all things are under his authority, that does not include God himself, who gave Christ his authority. Then when all things, everyone say that word, two words, all things. Now, what do you suppose that means? Hallelujah. It doesn't leave anything out. All things. I'll never forget, I worked with a man, and he says, well, you know, Jesus is not Lord over everything. I said to him, if I read the scripture right, it says he has authority over all things. Yes, but he said that's not actually reality. That just gets me. Jesus Christ is Lord over everything, or he would have never been able to defeat the principalities and the powers. In fact, when it says he made a show of them openly, he made a show of them openly. When, when all things are under his authority, the Son will put himself under God's authority so that he gave his Son authority, it says it again, over all things, will be utterly supreme over everything, everywhere. The biggest problem we got, and this is what this man said, he says, well, you know, not everybody has accepted Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, so he's not Lord over them. Oh, yes, he is, but their eyes haven't been opened yet, and their ears are stopped up, and they haven't recognized him. That does not make him not having authority over all things. He has authority. People just don't realize it yet. Well, so this is good news. Ephesians 6, 12 says, we do not wrestle Everyone say wrestle. How many have seen a wrestling match? I have participated in a wrestling match. Don't look at me like that. I wasn't built like I am now. In fact, I've never been all bulked up like Brandon. I, I, I used to do those things where you... Put, you know, the big bar with the, with the heavy weights or on each end. I could do three-quarter squats with just 10 pounds over my own weight. Not bad for a skinny rig. I used to run. In my, I had big muscles in my legs. I could run. I could tell you stories, but that'll get me off on a rabbit trail. We do not wrestle against flesh and blood. I did wrestle. They were trying to teach us how to wrestle. And I, I did what I, this is what I discovered. I ha, was in the wrestling match, but do you know what? I discovered I didn't have the gift. I didn't win very often. But the hardest thing, I, I wasn't put down very often either because my legs were long and they were strong. They had a hard time. I loved it when I could wrap my legs around the other guy and I could squeeze. I, I knew I had a half a chance. But this says we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness, of this age against spiritual hosts of wickedness where in heavenly places these are the same principalities and powers that Jesus disarmed praise the lord we wrestle the wrestling match is in the spiritual realm which is more 
real than the one we see. We just don't recognize or do we see the spirit realm very often. I worked with a gentleman for a number of years, traveled in ministry together, and he was in the truest sense a, a prophet. In the truest sense, he was a seer. And I called him a seer. He did not say that of himself, but I called it that he was a seer because he saw the realm of the Spirit so often. He saw it, and he dealt with it. But our translations say that he disarmed. One translation says that he spoiled. I like either word. Praise the Lord. Now, as I have said already in this series, God has left it up to us to enforce every day in the earth's trenches the victory that he has won in the heavens. This is the arena of warfare. It is not a physical fight. The disciples were continuously dwelling and thinking about Jesus coming in and taking over the Romans. He expected that him to have a physical army that would take care of those that were oppressing them. But Jesus did not come to fight a physical fight. That's to come. It's already a fixed fight. He's already an overcomer. And every, at one day, every eye will recognize him. It's not a fair fight. He's already overcome. When he comes, the Bible says he will put them down with a breath. And it's not because he had bad breath. It is because of the power and the anointing that he slays his enemy with the breath of his mouth. Praise the Lord. But he, <laughs> this book of Ephesians teaches us that the church has resources and is equipped with vast spiritual weapons in order for that they too can overcome. In fact, when you read the book of Revelation, how often does it say, to him that overcomes, to him that overcomes, to him that overcomes. When people become Christians, one of the hardest things for them to do is to retrain not to continue to operate according to the world's system. And again, we've taught you, by the way, if you, uh, if you uh, uh, want to go back and revisit some of those things that we've taught you, we're at, there are four sessions on Sunday mornings, and you will find you can see them all and hear them all. So, we've taught you that it took one night to get Israel out of Egypt, but 40 years to get Egypt out of them. There's always a battle between the new man and the old man. There is a standing in and an overcoming on the basis of what Jesus has accomplished on the cross. And that is the reason why we need the teachings of like that Paul gave to the, to the Ephesians. In Romans chapter 5, verse 1 and 2, it says, Therefore, since we have, we have been made right in God's sight. I could camp out on that one for a while. Because you may look at yourself and say, I don't sure feel like that. You don't know what I've done, Pastor. Well, when you sin, we have an advocate, Jesus, who's at the right hand of the Father. 
and he's ever making intercessions. All that remains for us is to believe in our heart and to confess with our mouth. And the Bible says we are saved. We are made right in God's sight by faith. We have peace with God because of what Jesus Christ, our Lord, has done for us. Because of our faith, Christ has brought us into the place of undeserved privilege. And that place of privilege is where we stand now. Why don't you turn to your neighbor and say... Where are you standing? It says we can confidently and joyfully look forward to sharing God's glory. And so Paul the Apostle in Ephesians chapter 5, he said, Therefore, be imitators of God. Whew. That's a big one. But how do we do that? Well, based on what Jesus has done for us, when you read the book of Ephesians, you find out who we are in him and what he is in us. Paul says, therefore. Now that word therefore, that means there was something previously said that we ought to pay attention to. In chapter 3, he says, Now to him who is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or think according. There's that word we've been talking about. Remember what that word according means? In harmony. That instrument can produce harmonies. Oftentimes, people sing in harmony. To what we ask or think according to the power that works where? In us. Okay. Lord, I wonder if they got it. Because, Lord, the same power that raised Christ Jesus from the dead you said in your word, the same power that raised Christ from the dead lives in us. Ooh. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Lives and works in us. So every time we overcome a battle, it's to Him the Father gets the glory. To him, glory in the church by Christ Jesus. Jesus, by Christ Jesus, to all generations forever and ever. That's how I know that this thing works today. I'm not just telling you something that worked with the apostles. This thing was for all generations. Praise the Lord. And I'm glad that it includes you and me so that we can win the battles in life. We do not have to do this thing alone. This is where God desires us to be. And some of what we, what we read next all pertains to the context in the verse. God has called us to do what we cannot do on our own. And it does affect the spiritual realm. And Paul says, therefore, he speaks to the place we are in, praise the Lord. And so, it must be possible. If Paul the apostle said it, it must be possible to be imitators of God. What an opener. I hope that you've done your homework and you've read Ephesians chapter 5. We'll continue and do Ephesians chapter 6 when we come home.
be imitators, followers of God. Do you know that the basic idea of Christianity is to imitate Christ? To do outwardly for others what he has done inwardly in you. And so, in verse 2, it says, walk in love. How? As Christ also has loved us and given himself for us, an offering and a sacrifice to God, a sweet aroma. Don't you blame God for your shortcomings. In fact, a better way to live in this new life is to put your flesh on the altar as a sacrifice. You say, well, I literally need to come down there and lay on that altar? Paul says he crucifies the flesh. Not as I live, but Christ lives in me. Verse 3, but for fornication and uncleanness and covetousness, not let, don't let them be named among you as is fitting for saints. That includes all kinds of sexual sins. Neither filthiness, nor foolish talking, nor coarse jesting, which are not fitting, but rather giving thanks. I could talk about this, but, you know, you can read it for yourselves. In verse 5, For this you know, that no fornicator, unclean person, nor covetous, nor who is an idolater, has any inheritance in the king and in Christ in the kingdom of Christ and God. There are lifestyles that have nothing to do with living the new life. Ephesians 8 For you were once darkness. That means we used to do those things. But now, everyone say but now. But now you are light in the Lord. So it says, walk as children of the light. Praise the Lord. You know, verse 11 says, have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness, but it says, rather expose them. And that does not mean that we go around pointing fingers. You expose them by living in the light. Praise the Lord. You're not the judge. Praise the Lord. Whew, that's big. Where did that come from? From the Word. We're not the judge. <laughs> Glory to God. Don't work in the unfruitful, don't work in the unfruitful works. When we're born again, the enemy has no right to reproduce his fruit anymore in our lives. Reprove them, expose them. There's no compromise with the unfruitful works of darkness. Shine the light. When you shine the light, the Holy Spirit is the one who convicts and purges and cleans. Walking in the light as he is in the light are not accomplished by signs and protest. Jesus walked and worked among the darkness, and, he, and yet he still drew crowds. He used miracles and signs and wonders. He drew people in by healing them, not by pointing out their sin. But I'll tell you, he had some words to say to the religious. He called them generation of vipers and everything else. He did not mix words with the religious. Ephesians 12, 5, 12 says, For it is shameful even to speak of those things which are done by them in secret. You know, when you speak of something, you magnify or intensify to the generation around. And usually it's worse, gets worse with the next generation. Boy, oh boy. It says, verse 14, Awake! You who sleep, arise from the dead, and Christ will give you light. Are you comfortable at working in the light, or are you comfortable at working in the darkness? They don't mix. But let me say this, 
Light expels darkness. You know that darkness does not dispel light. God didn't create things that way. See, verse 15 says, walk circumspectly, not as fools. That, that, that word circumspectly in the King James actually means walk carefully, purposefully, worthily, accurately in order to be. Why does he want us to walk accurately before him? So that we would be imitators of God. 16 says, redeeming the time because the days are evil. Now, I used to think when that, normally when we think of time, we think of the clock. And we'll, we'll say, well, you know, we, we got to redeem the, the time. You can never get time back. But actually, this word time in the Greek means karios. Those are moments of God's visitation. It's not chronos that we're often used to, not measured by the clock. This is the time in God's presence. We are imitators of God by being in his presence. You know, one thing that I learned about married life is, you know, sometimes you take on some of the traits of your partner. You ever notice that? Well, and you know, when you grow up with your family and you're, somebody will often say, you know, you're just like your father or you're just like your mother. Well, why is that? Because you're spending time with them. You grew up and that was your environment. Well, let me tell you, when you get in the presence of Jesus, you become like him. So, you know, it's wonderful to get in the presence of God. I, and there are ways that we can purposely worthily and accurately get into the presence of God. Verse 18 says, Do not be drunk with, with wine, which is dispensation, which, by the word, is a word everybody stumbles over if they're reading the King James, and it basically means excess. Don't be drunk with wine in excess. But it does say, be filled with the Spirit. So I'm not here to preach against wine. I have friends that drink wine. In some cultures, their water's not good, so they drink wine. That was the case in uh, Israel for many years. Well, you know, it does say, be filled with the Spirit. There are many parallels between the intoxication of wine and the intoxication of the Spirit. And uh, some of the folks on the day of Pentecost in Acts 2, they were mistakenly uh, saying about the people that th these people are, are drunk. On the day of Pentecost, they're drunk. But they were not drunk with the wine of men. But let me tell you, there are times that you kind of get lost in the Holy Spirit and you're under the influence of the Holy Spirit and you do some very unusual things. Some of you have may not seen any of that, but there are those of us that have seen a lot of that. And uh, whew, I'll tell you, it's better felt than told. Verse 19 says, speaking to one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs and singing and making melody in your heart, how in the world can you do that outside of being in the presence of God? Speaking and singing to yourselves. Not listening to others speak and sing about God. It's you singing to God. It's a very real relationship. And by the way, you cannot fulfill this by being by yourself, because it does say, speaking to one another. How do you speak to one another if you're not in the presence of one another? So, submitting to one another, verse 21, submitting to one another in the fear of the Lord. Again, how do you do that with just yourself, 
when the body of Christ gets together, we, we submit to one another. How? This is the key, and I hope you'll see it. Submitting to one another in the fear, King James uses the words, in the fear of God. God has chosen submission as a principle of the kingdom. True godly submission sets the tone for all relationships. The key to submission is when you give up your will for God's. It's submission. Whew. Praise God. It's your mission under God's mission. Submission doesn't mean there is not disagreement or conflict. That's not submission. That's just agreement. True submission is only found in the fear of the Lord. And when you have the fear of the Lord, our submission is easy to one another. Wow. The word submit was a Greek military term meaning to arrange as groups in, in divisions in a military in military fashion under the command of a leader. Some people think of it is in non military use as a volunteer a voluntary attitude of giving in. But when it's uh, you are cooperating, you are assuming responsibility, and you are sharing and carrying the burden of another. Boy, you talk to the to the those that to work in the army, and they rely on one another. That's why they never leave one another behind. Whose burden are we to carry? Well, God's burden. We think of this word as, as just wrong because of the pattern that people have forced on others to submit, to comply. But that is the way of the world and the powers of the age. When you oppress and you submit, so... Paul gives us examples of what the relationship with God is like so that we can submit to him and to one another. He doesn't use, you know, the following examples in verses 22 to 33 as, well, if things aren't going right, I'll just tell my wife, you're supposed to submit. Get in the program, woman. That's not his idea. That is not God's idea. See, you know, we, we often read these in, on occasions like weddings and things or if there's trouble in the home. Wives, submit to your own husbands as to the Lord. All they read is, submit to your husbands. Well, I've been doing some counseling in the past and they go, Whew, I can't do that one. Don't tell me to submit to him. Well, that relationship's not going to work very well then. <laughs> Wives, submit to your own husbands as to the Lord. For husbands is the head of the wife, as also Christ is the head of the church, and he is the Savior of the body. Paul is not stating a doctrinal stance. He's using the relationship because Paul is talking about the mystery. He's continually talking about the mystery. It's good that we treat one another these ways, but he's giving it and using it as an illustration of how to live the new life in Christ. The mystery of Christian marriage. Marriage is not the issue here. The mystery is the issue. God wants you to make your marriage a sacrifice unto him so that people who do not see the mystery can see your marriage 
and through seeing your marriage, they'll understand the mystery of Christ and his church. Should I say that one again? Marriage is not the issue here. The mystery is the issue. God wants to make your marriage a sacrifice unto him so that people who do not see the mystery of God can see your marriage through seeing your marriage understand the mystery of Christ and the church. Both both men and women are deeply challenged here to play their parts. Wives submit in the fear of of the Lord, like like the church ought to, in the fear of the Lord, submit to one another and to him. Husbands are to love like Christ. God says, in the process of your struggling to play your roles, you will appreciate even more what I have done for you. The only way a marriage can survive for years is for a man to crucify his flesh and for the wife to make her flesh submit, not my will, but thine. Understand, he's talking about the mystery. Ephesians 5, 26, that he might sanctify and cleanse her with the washing of the water by the word. Christ loves something that he had to keep working on. He didn't leave it. That is the pattern for Christian marriage. You work on it as Christ is working on the church. After all, the church is his body. Verse 26, he might sanctify and cleanse her with the washing of the water by the word. And... People say, well, you know, it uses that word her. The church, the church must be the bride. Like I said, this is not a doctrinal statement. He's trying to use the relationship so that we can understand the mystery. So husbands are to love their own wives as their own bodies. He who loved his wife loves himself to the degree you love your wife men you love yourself to the degree that you hate your wife you hate yourself no one ever hated his own flesh but nourishes it and cherishes it just as the lord does the church the word nourish is to feed The word cherish is to esteem. So we feed esteem. Feed esteem. Feed, that's what our jobs are as men. That we would feed and esteem. You are to be the head of your home. You ought to lead in areas of devotion. It's not just about having devotion so that you can do your duty to God. Devotions You live a devoted life unto the Lord. Devotions is a lifestyle. The most intimate, God uses the most intimate relationship we have on earth. That is what God is trying to use to portray his relationship with his church. God wants to use our house to preach to our community. God wants to use our house to preach to the community because who we are at home is who we really are. Husbands love, wives submit, or we reverence, or we respect. Do you know that when Satan tempted Eve, Satan was trying to get at Adam. Satan doesn't care, doesn't dare attack God directly. He already tried that, and he lost. So he attacks the man. He attacks the church. If he can destroy unity, he can hinder the work of God on the earth. When a a man and a woman connect, they produce fruit. Just like God and his church. 
when the church connects with God, what do they do? They produce fruit. So that's why the serpent attacked Eve first. She had to get to the man, but he was really after the man to break the union in Eden. The fall of, of humanity did not take place when Eve was deceived and ate. The fall of humanity took place when Adam deliberately and intentionally ate. The Bible says Eve was deceived. But Adam decided it was his decision that caused the fall of humanity. Uh, it's 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 13, that tells us that Eve was deceived. Adam did not guard or keep his wife safe in the garden. Does not say something. Adam did not do his job. God told Adam to guard and to keep it. The sins we commit that are born of deception, of deception is still sin, but it strikes at the very nature of our relationship with God. That's why sin needs to be readily confessed and repented and cast aside. James 5.16 says, Confess your sins to each other and pray for each other so that you may be healed. The earnest prayer of a righteous person has great power and produces wonderful results. Why do we encourage you to pray? Why do we encourage you to step out into the aisles and allow people to pray? The sins that we commit out of our will has a, as a conscious decision. The plan and the actions are destructive and deadly to our relationship. In 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 45, the scripture tells us, The first man, Adam, became a living person, but the last Adam, that is Christ, is a life-giving spirit. What comes first is the natural body, and then the spirit body comes later. Adam, the first man, was made from the dust of the earth, while Christ, the second one, come from heaven. When Adam and Eve both entered into the state of death, they both ate of the fruit that they were forbidden to eat. Everything under their domain Come under death. That's what a kingdom is. It's a domain. And a domain is something you rule over. It's something you rule and govern. When a king falls, a kingdom falls. The domain falls with them. When Eve took the forbidden fruit, Adam knew she was going to die. And it's almost like he said, I love her so much, I'm willing to die for her and with her, so he eats too. The first Adam mistake was that he loved the gift more than the giver. Everything they produced after that and everything they had dominion or domain over fell to. Romans chapter 5, verse 12. When Adam sinned, sin entered the world. Adam's sin brought death. So death spread to everyone, for everyone sinned. Verse 15. But there is a great difference between Adam's sin and God's gracious gift. For the sin of this one man... Adam brought death to many, but even greater, everyone say that, those two words with me, even greater, 
Even greater is God's wonderful grace and his gift of forgiveness to many through Jesus Christ. So talking about believers, verse 30 says, we are members of his body, of his flesh and his bones. That means, folks, that sin is not normal behavior for the believer. Sin is never to be routine for the believer. Sin is not inevitable for the believer. Jesus died for our freedom. We are members of his flesh and of his bones. But because of what Jesus has done for us, we are set free. Praise the Lord. For this reason... A man shall leave his father and his mother and be joined to his wife, and the two shall be one flesh. Here is what Paul's getting at. We leave the world of sin. We leave its sin, and we are joined together in Christ Jesus. Praise the Lord. We leave the world's sin and be joined to Jesus Christ. This Verse 32, this is a great mystery. He says it all. He wraps it up. This is a great mystery. So I speak concerning Christ and the church. That's the reason why I say to you that what he does is he gives us an example from an earthly relationship so that we would understand what the relationship is, what relationship we have to Christ. I said last week, as we grow up in the Lord, we understand more, and then we surrender more. We worship because we now have stepped beyond praising God for our condition to worshiping Him from our position. The Scripture reads that we are seated with Him beside the Father. In Scripture, A mystery is something hidden, is is not something hidden, but it is something revealed. And with the mystery is something that is not only revealed, but submitted to. Verse 22 to 31 are clues what that relationship looks like and what it doesn't look like. It's not a doctrine for end times. This is a mystery He says in 32, I speak concerning Christ and and the church. In context, determines the meaning. So, Ephesians 3 says, In other ages, this mystery was not made known to the sons of men as it has been revealed by the Spirit to his holy apostles and the prophets, that the Gentiles should be fellow heirs of the same body and partakers of the promise in Christ. So now, we have boldness and access with confidence through faith. Paul says in Galatians 2.20, I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, not, uh, not, yet not I, but Christ lives in me. The, the life which I now live in the flesh I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me. So when Paul prays in Ephesians 3.16, he says, I would grant you according to the riches of his glory to be strengthened with might through his spirit in the inner man. That Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith that you being rooted and grounded in love may be able to comprehend with all the saints what is the width and length and depth of, and the height to know the love of Christ which passes knowledge that you may be what? That you may be as a church filled with all the fullness of God. So the question is, when are you going to decide that you want to be part of something bigger than yourself. Imitating Jesus. Walking in this new life. 
that's given from the Heavenly Father. To be a Christian means to decide on a new Lord so you can live the new life found in Jesus Christ. So, Ephesians 5, 2, walk in love as Christ also loved us and given himself for us an offering and a sacrifice to God. That means that we are in him through hard through the hard times and the good times. So, be imitators of God as dear children, followers of God, to imitate Christ outwardly for others, what God has done inwardly in you. Don't let your past or your traumas define you. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. I want to sing a song for you that I wrote in 1982. Check. Thank you, Jesus. It says it all. and made his heirs and sons angels at our side the spirit makes us one hallelujah we're the overcoming ones <laughs> hallelujah we're the overcoming ones hallelujah we're the overcoming ones heal it without blemish or sin at all he lived and example to follow by his promise of blessing we see it's ours too if we follow believe he went into the grave and he overcame the devil and his demons and angels by name he took authority lost into the fall he gave it back to christians who will heal them their soul jesus won the fight devils on the run Father granted rights and made us as his sons. Angels at our side, the Spirit makes us one. Hallelujah, we're the overcoming ones. Hallelujah, we're the overcoming ones. Hallelujah, we're the overcoming ones.
Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Praise the name of Jesus. I'm going to suggest to you that if you feel like, man, I don't have the authority I'm supposed to have, well, you get with other believers. Get with them. Tag up. Glory to God. And uh, come to an understanding of who Christ is in you. He desires a place for you you can actually walk in. You say, well, Pastor, I haven't even decided to follow Jesus. You can decide that in, in a moment. Glory to God. Jesus, I am a sinner. I recognize I need you. You are my Lord and my Savior. Please come into my life. Dwell in me so that I can be with you one day. But I can also right now live in your presence to help me live this new life in Jesus' name. And now, Father, I pray your blessing upon this congregation that as they walk out of these doors, they'll know that you have made them overcomers and that you have a pattern for us to live this new life in Jesus. Let the light of your countenance rest on them so they can lead many to you. And let those that are watching online come to know you as their personal Lord and Savior so that they can walk in this new life. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you.